core to the cloud. In this video, we're going to talk about something completely different called sequences, which you've probably seen before. A sequence is simply an infinite ordered list of objects. And for us, it's going to be an ordered list of numbers. And we've seen things like 2, 9, 16, 23, 30. We can see that all of these consecutive terms have a common difference of 7. Or in this case, I have a common difference of negative 3. And those are called arithmetic sequences. But honestly, we're not really going to work with them too much. Maybe we'll see them in a few examples or on the homework. Now, sequences can have repeated terms. They don't have to necessarily follow a, a nice formula. Uh, we could have a sequence with all the same number. I could have a sequence which repeats a pattern of numbers like zero, I'm sorry, one comma zero comma negative one comma zero comma one comma zero comma negative one. So it's just repeating this one zero negative one zero. And then it does it again, one zero negative one zero and so on. Or a simpler pattern would just be one negative one, one negative one. Now, if you have a sequence with a common ratio between consecutive terms. Those are called geometric sequences. And we'll see all them a lot. And a common ratio here would be if I take 3 over 6, the common ratio is a half. 6 over 12, 1 half. 12 over 24 is 1 half, and so on. Here, the common ratio is 1 tenth. If I were to take uh, 0.02 and divide it by 0.2, I would get one-tenth or 0 0.1. So the idea is to get to the next term, you just multiply the previous term by the common ratio. So, oh, let's look at this one step at a time. So we use a letter with a subscript to denote a single term in a sequence. So if I have a sequence here with these terms, 8, 4, 2, 1, 0 0.5 and 0 0.25 and so on, you see this is a geometric sequence. Then I would say a sub 1 is 8. a sub 2 is 4. The third term is 2, so a sub 3 equals 2, and so on. Uh, the way we write down a sequence is we may write down uh, just um, a sub n or the formula for a sub n inside brackets. We may emphasize that we're starting from 1 by putting n equals 1 to infinity. If we do have a formula, like for this sequence, it would be 8 times in parentheses 1 half raised to the power of n minus 1. I could write it and then again emphasize that n starts at 1. Or I could write the formula in brackets and use a superscript and subscript to say n equals 1 to infinity. But it's really understood that if I just write down the formula, that n is starting from 1 and, of course, goes to infinity. But I don't have to start at 1. Um, I could start at n equals 0 or sometimes n equals 3. Sometimes I have to start with a different number just based on what the formula is. So again, let's look at this slide in one step at a time. If I want to look at the first uh, five terms of uh, the sequence here, well, that would just be 3 plus, well, uh, when n equals 1, that would be 1 half, so 3 and a half. When n equals 2, I'll get 1 over 2 squared. That's 1 fourth plus 3, so I'll get 3 and a fourth. And then so on. I get one, 3 plus 1 over 2 cubed, 
3 plus 1 over 2 to the 4th, 3 plus 1 over 2 to the 5th. In our second example, this is a case where I have to start with n equal to 3 or larger, because otherwise the formula would not give me a real number. And so uh, then my first five terms would be, well, I'll go ahead and subtract 2 from the index, and then uh, take the radical. So radical of 1 is 1, when n equals 4, right? Uh, then uh, I'll have radical 2. When n equals 5, I'll have radical 3. And when n equals 6, I get radical 6 minus 2. That would be radical 4. And so that's 2. And finally, when n equals 7, uh, I would have uh, radical 5. So in our last example, I have this 1 over n with this exclamation mark, that's n factorial. And remember that n factorial just means you start with n, multiply it times the next lower integer, so n has to be an integer, n times the next lower integer, all the way down to you multiply by 1. And we say that to make our formulas work, it's convenient to have a special definition for 0 factorial, it wouldn't make sense in the other definition here. So we're going to define 0 factorial to be 1. And these three uh, lines, three like an equal sign with an extra line, just means is defined to be. So now my first five terms would be 1 over uh, 0 factorial, because here I specify that I want to start with the 0, 1 over 1 factorial, and so on up to 1 over 4 factorial. So uh, 0 factorial, 1 factorial, just 1. 2 times 1 is 2. 3 times 2 times 1 gives me 6. And 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 gives me 24. So my first five terms are 1, 1, 1 half, 1 sixth, and 1 over 24. Let's do a couple more. Um, in this example, part D, I have negative 1 raised to the power of n. Um, remember that negative 1 raised to an even power will be a positive 1, and negative 1 raised to an odd power will give me a negative 1. And so uh, whenever you see this, this is just indicating that the sign on the terms alternate between negative 1 and positive 1. And so our first term is negative 1 third, then we get positive 1 ninth, negative 1 over 27, and you can see the pattern. Uh, cosine of n pi over 2, so we're going to look at cosine of integer multiples of pi over 2. So cosine is a periodic function, so we expect to see a repeating pattern. And so cosine of 1 pi over 2 would be 0. Cosine of 2 pi over 2 would be cosine of pi, which is negative 1. Cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. Cosine of 4 pi over 2 is the same as cosine of 2 pi, which is 1. And then we get to cosine of 5 pi over 2, which will be the same as cosine of pi over 2, which is 0. So actually, these first four numbers will start repeating themselves. But we're only asked to find the first five terms. We could have a sequence which is, a sequence which is recursively defined. That means it's defined by giving a starting value, like a sub 1 equals 3. And then a formula to find the next value using the previous value. So this says that a sub n plus 1 will be twice a sub n, and then you subtract 1. So for example, to get a sub 2, I'll take 2 times 3, because 3 was a sub 1, and then subtract 1 to get 5. So now to get the next term, I should take 2 times 5, and then subtract 1. That'll give me 9. 
to get the fourth term, two times nine, and then subtract one. And then my fifth term is two times 17 and subtract one. A famous recursively defined uh, sequence is called the Fibonacci sequence. The, and this one actually uses the previous two terms. And so we have to give two initial values. So we're gonna start with a zero. So the zeroth term is one, and the first term is one. And then to get the next term, we take the sum of the previous two. And so I would take one plus one equals two. That's gonna be my second term. Then I'll take two plus one to get three. Then three plus one, I'm sorry, three plus two to get five. And then five plus three to get eight. Uh, using the formula, uh, writing it out into the formula, it's actually harder than just writing out the terms. Uh, if you start with one, one, then you just know I have to add these two to get two, the next two to get three, the next two to get eight, the next two will give me 13, 13 plus eight is 21, 21 plus 13 is 34, and so on. So what about the limit of a sequence? Well, as n approaches infinity, if the terms of the sequence approach a number L, um, then and, um, they can be mar made arbitrarily close whenever n is sufficiently large. Then we say that that number L is the limit value. Formally, we could have this uh, type of uh, formal definition, which was we, which says that the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n equals L, provided that if I take any positive number epsilon, so epsilon is understood to be a small positive number, there's going to be a positive integer capital N such that whenever lowercase n is larger than uppercase n, the absolute value between the terms and our limit value is smaller than epsilon. And we're gonna use the same terminology we used with improper integrals when we were taking a limit. We said if the limit exists and is finite, we say the sequence converges or is convergent. And if the limit does not exist or if the limit is infinite, we would say the sequence diverges or is divergent. We could also have uh, an infinite limit for sequences. It just means that it's going to grow without bound in either the positive direction or the negative direction. And our limit laws will hold for convergent sequences. If A sub n and B sub n are convergent sequences, and a sub n approaches L as n goes to infinity, b sub n approaches M, then our limit laws hold. In other words, the uh, sum of the limits is the limit of the sum. I should say that the other way around. The limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. The limit of the difference is the difference of the limits. The limit of the product is the product of the limits. The limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limits. Of course, you can't have zero in the denominator. And if I have a uh, sequence raised where each term is raised to a power, if that's a convergent sequence, then the limit is just going to be uh, the L raised to the power of P. In fact, if uh, I needed to write in here that if I have a continuous function, any continuous function uh, f, so let me go ahead and write that in there. I want to make sure that I put that next. 
So if I have a continuous function at f in the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x equals l, oh, I apologize. It's, I don't necessarily have to have a continuous function. That would be nice. Uh, for this particular situation, this is just some tools that we can use uh, to help us calculate the limits of sequences. We could go from a sequence to a, con to a function of x, and then when we convert back to x, we can use tools like L'Hopital's rule, right? And so um, if we can calculate the limit when we have f of x, then we consider each term a sub n to be f of n, and then um, use the same limit value. And then just some other facts that uh, if, remember that if you have any index which is positive, then one over x raised to that power or that index is going to go to zero as um, x goes to infinity. And so we can say the same thing for one over n to the power of r. And just a quick note that, you know, sometimes we can look at a sequence as a function. Its domain is the natural numbers. So this suggests exactly that right here. We could say that a sub n would use the same formula as the function f, but would only be defined on the natural numbers, so one, two, three, and so on. And we call them discrete, uh, discrete functions. Uh, their domain and range are individual numbers, so if you were to graph them, they would just be dots as opposed to our usual functions, which are defined on a connected subset of the real line. Uh, we also have a squeeze theorem, not a surprise. We had a squeeze theorem for, con uh, for regular functions, continuous functions, and so uh, also for discrete functions uh, as well. So if I have sequences, if the B sub N sequence is squeezed between a sub n and c sub n, and the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n and c sub n both equal the same number l, then the sequence in the middle must also approach l as n goes to infinity. So here's an example. We often see the squeeze theorem with trig functions, sines and cosines, because we know that both sine and cosine are bounded below by negative one and above by positive one. So the terms of our sequence here are bounded below by negative one over n and above by one over n. And so the limit as n goes to infinity of both of those outer sequences is going to be zero. So I can conclude by the squeeze theorem that the limit as n goes to infinity of cosine of n over n is also zero. So another quick note, we want when we're giving an explanation or we're trying to uh, determine if a sequence is a convergent or divergent, we have to make a conclusion which explains, of course, we need all of these other steps. All of this other wording is important, but we also need to explain, well, how do we know this? And so this phrase, by the squeeze theorem, is essential. We always have to quote what theorem, what test, what reasoning are we using in order to determine this conclusion. We're going to use this theorem later uh, in this video where we say that if, if we know that the absolute value of the terms of our sequence approach zero, then the original sequence will also approach zero. Now be careful because this 
only works when the terms or the absolute value of the terms are approaching zero. And we'll see that a lot of times it's much easier to work with positive numbers. So whenever we take the absolute value of the terms, we'll only be working with the positive numbers. All right, so here's the theorem I was thinking about previously, and I did state that f has to be continuous at L. So if I know that the limit of a sequence is L, f is continuous at L, then uh, we can essentially uh, bring the limit inside the argument of the function. So we can just take the limit inside the, the function, find that, that it's L, and then that'll be the limit value then of our new sequence where we're taking the function of the sequence terms. And so let's look at an example. So uh, inside uh, the sign argument, I have pi over two minus one over n. Uh, now, the only term that contains the n is the 1 over n. And so as n goes to infinity, 1 over n goes to 0. So pi over 2 minus 1 over n just goes to pi over 2. So I've just brought the limit inside the sine function. And so then I can say that the limit as n goes to infinity of sine of pi over 2 minus 1 over n will just be sine of pi over 2, which is 1. So here we're uh, looking again at a factorial. We have a formula n factorial over n to the power of n. And the question is, is that going to converge or diverge? It's really asking the question, which is growing faster, n factorial or n to the power of n? So maybe we should just look at some of the terms. So we can look at the first term uh, and I get one. And so one is less than or equal to one. The second term is a half, which is less than or equal to one half. And you may be saying, why is he putting the inequality? These are equals. Well, because why did I put n there? I should have said a sub two. Sometimes I do that. So a sub 2 is less than or equal to 1 half. a sub 3, now, how do, now you can see that, oh, OK, uh, I don't have equality here. And how do I know that this is less than 1 third without doing all of the arithmetic? Well, the key is this two-thirds in the middle. Two-thirds is less than one. Three over three is equal to one. So I'm taking three times a number less than one. That makes something less than one. Times one-third. And so a number less than one times one-third is going to be less than one-third. Same idea with the fourth term. Four over four is one. Three over four is less than one. 2 over 4 is less than 1. So if I take the product, I'll get a number less than 1. If I take a number less than 1 and multiply it times 1 fourth, the result is going to be less than 1 fourth. And so you can see a pattern here where a sub n is less than or equal to 1 over n. And now I can use the squeeze theorem. Certainly, uh, all of the a sub n are going to be positive numbers, so they're greater than or equal to 0. They're less than 1 over n. The limit of those outer sequences as n goes to infinity are both equal to 0. So I can conclude then that the limit of our original sequence is going to be 0 as well. So what does that tell me? That n to the power of n grows faster than n factorial. And of course, I want to answer the question. The question says, does 
this uh, sequence converge or diverge, and the conclusion is that it converges. All right, what if I have a power? I have r to the power of n is my formula for my sequence. For what values of r is that going to be converging? We might already know this, but let's look at an argument for it. We're going to start to assume that r is greater than zero. This is the case where if we had a negative r, we would look at the absolute value of r. But let's just suppose that r is positive. And we'll look at the corresponding function, f of x equals r to the power of x. Let me replace y, f of x with y. And then take the log of both sides. Now, if the natural log of r is less than 0, and that can only be true if r is uh, between 0 and uh, 1, then if I take the limit as x goes to infinity of x times the natural log of r, I'll get negative infinity. And so then if I go back to my original y equals r to the power of x and let x go to infinity, well, that's taking the limit of as x goes to infinity of the natural log of y as the exponent, e as the base. Remember that e to the natural log of y is just y. Now I can, this is a continuous function. So I can bring the limit into the exponent. And as the exponent goes to negative infinity, e raised to that is going to go to 0. Remember that if I e to the negative u goes to 0 as u goes to infinity. And of course, on the other hand, if the natural log of r is uh, greater than or equal to 0, um, then this limit uh, is going to be um, infinity. And so we would get a uh, an infinite limit. So we know that uh, a sub n raised to the r to the n is convergent whenever r is less than or equal to 1. Uh, I could have an equal to, because if I just had r equal to 1, then I would have a constant function. So I should include that. Uh, it wouldn't be true if r equals negative 1. So let me just make a note. I could have r equal to 1, uh, but otherwise I need uh, r, the absolute value of r to be less than 1. And again, here I'm using the idea that if I know that the limit of the absolute value of the terms is 0, uh, which would be the case if r were, say, negative 1 half uh, by the argument that I gave, then I know that the limit of the original terms is also going to be 0. So here are two new terms, bounded and monotonic. Bounded we've been using for a long time. In terms of a sequence, we say that the sequence a sub n is bounded above. If we've got a, cat, a number, uppercase m, where a sub n is always less than or equal to uppercase m. We could also say that it's bounded below if there's a number p where uh, a sub n is greater than or equal to p for all n. And we saw that uh, actually when we were using the squeeze theorem. And then uh, we say that the sequence is just bounded if it's bounded above and bounded below. So it has to be bounded 
both above and below. Remember that we can consider the sequence as a discrete function. And so the terminology for increasing and decreasing uh, also makes sense. We say it's increasing if the uh, terms, uh, the next, sorry, if, when you have consecutive terms, the next term is larger than or equal to the previous. Decreasing means that it's going to be uh, getting smaller as n gets larger. And then monotonic is just a really a shortcut for saying either increasing or decreasing. And so a very nice important theorem is that if you have a bounded monotonic sequence, it will be convergent. The idea is that it's only moving in one direction, but it can't ever get past either the top bound or the lower, lower bound. And so uh, eventually it's going to have to settle or get infinitely close to a single number. So here we have a sequence, 2 to the power of n over n factorial. We'd like to determine if it's convergent or divergent. Uh, whenever we have factorials, we can't convert back to a function of x uh, because the factorial is only defined for the whole numbers. But what we can do is look at the ratio of consecutive terms. All of these terms are going to be positive. So that's that's all, all of this sequence is bounded below by zero. But let's see if we can uh, determine if it's bounded above and if it's increasing or decreasing. Well, one way to show that a uh, sequence is increasing or decreasing if the sequence contains only positive terms is to look at the ratio of the consecutive terms. If the ratio is greater than one, uh, then we would have an increasing. If it's less than one, we would have a decreasing sequence. So let me look at this ratio and do some arithmetic. Now, uh, one thing I did do with the n plus one in parentheses factorial is, remember, n plus one factorial is the same as taking n plus one and multiplying it times n factorial. And that allows us to uh, simplify. I also use the property of exponents. 2 to the power of n plus 1 is 2 times 2 to the power of n. So that simplifies greatly to 2 over n plus 1. And for uh, any number greater than 1, 2 over n plus 1 is smaller than 1. And so we can conclude that as n gets larger, the terms get smaller. So we have a decreasing sequence, at least uh, for n greater than 1. And um, so if it's decreasing and we have all positive terms, then the first term is going to be the largest one. The first term is 2. So our lower bound is 0. We have all positive terms. Our upper bound is our first term a sub 1. And uh, since it's bounded and it's in and it's decreasing, I'm sorry, decreasing, uh, then we can conclude that it's converging. Now, please note that, uh, you know, we had an argument here to show that it is decreasing when n is bigger than 1. So we had to start with n equals 2. But that's okay. We're going to do that a lot. We may have to start with n equals 5 or n equals 13 um, because really the only thing that we're interested in terms of convergence or divergence is what we call the tail of the sequence. What happens when n is large? That's what matters. If the first five terms has something else going on, uh, that's not going to impact the convergence or the divergence of the sequence.
All right, let's look at some of these examples in detail. We'd like to determine if the following sequences are convergent or divergent. So uh, our first one has the formula 5 raised to the power of n plus 2 over 7 to the power of n. We're going to do some arithmetic to first rewrite that as 5 squared times 5 to the n over 7 to the n. And then I'm going to combine this 5 to the n over 7 to the n as a single fraction. So I'll get 25 times the fraction 5 over 7 to the power of n. Now 5 over 7 is less than 1. And so as n goes to infinity, uh, this is going to converge to 0. In our second example, we have a radical of a rational function in n. And so I'm just going to look at what's under the radical. I'll go to x, so if I need to use any of my um, tools like L'Hopital's rule, I can use it. And working this out, I get the limit to be 1 fourth. So now I could just take that limit inside the radical sign. That'll give me radical 1 fourth or 1 half, which is, of course, convergent. Um, I should note that um, I'm going to try to be careful and write uh, x in place of n when I'm taking these limits. But it's not wrong to keep it in terms of n. Uh, it's just understood at that point that we're treating n as a continuous variable as opposed to a discrete variable. In part c, we have this negative 1 to the n plus 1, which again is telling us that the terms of this sequence are alternating between positive and negative. So I could write this as a piecewise defined formula where I have a positive term if n is odd, because then n plus 1, my exponent would be even, and negative 1 raised to an even power is a positive one. And if n is even, I would have a negative sign. I would have a negative term. So my terms alternate between uh, negative and positive. Now, if I just look at the upper branch here and look at the limit, uh, it's just going to approach 1, which means that the bottom formula is going to approach negative 1. And so I have some of my terms getting close to positive 1, and the other terms approaching negative 1. Uh, and it doesn't matter how large n gets, they're always going to be bouncing back and forth between getting close to positive 1 and getting close to negative 1. So this sequence would be divergent. Let's look at a couple more. Here I have arctan of n over n. Arctan is another great function which is bounded. It's bounded between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So we can use the squeeze theorem here and uh, find that the limit on the outer functions is going to be 0. So the limit by the squeeze theorem, the limit as n approaches infinity of our original sequence is also 0. And I can conclude that the sequence is convergent. With our last example, we have the difference of natural logs. Uh, so I can use log properties and write that as the natural log of n plus 1 over n. And again, I'm going to look at only the inside of this function. So the input is n plus 1 over n. Take the limit as n goes to infinity. You can see here I did not change to x, and that's fine. I get the limit of the inside equaling to 1. So the limit of the original sequence is going to converge to the natural log of 1 which is 0. So we have a convergent sequence. Well, thanks for sticking with me on this video. Uh, we're going to use this information in, throughout the rest of this chapter when we start talking about series.